6 p.m. <laughs> so good. What a what a day we're having in the house of God. I've had the privilege to be at all four services here today, but you guys are just rocking in for the 6 p.m. And who enjoyed that worship set? That's stunning. I feel like uh, you uh, youth, nations, youth are worshipping to those songs like they're your songs. <laughs> I feel like, and, and that's cool, we can share them. My generation is happy to share them with you. But there's just such a touch of God on them, isn't there? We're just, uh, you know, so thrilled to be able to set aside a day in our calendar and just call it Legacy Sunday because uh, it is right and it is proper and, and it is godly to honour. It is, it is so great to honour and I'm convinced that God smiles on it when we honour and, 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 and to our legacy leavers in the room, to our, our, our parents, be they biological or be they spiritual or to just ordinary people in the house of God that have blessed and have given and have shared and have been generous. We just want to say thank you. We just, we just really honour you and, and this day is all about you and and I think most people here in this space um, have left a legacy of some description whether they realize it or not so to a sense there's a sense where everyone is is honored and while we're thinking about this topic of legacy I've decided to to call this message tonight the end game hey I know you see what I did there? <laughs> see what I did there? You know, um, <laughs> don't worry, no spoilers, no spoilers coming from me. Nobody has to stress out about that. I haven't seen the movie and I'm not even that interested in seeing the movie. Well, I know, it's like the, the most, you know, controversial thing you can say. It seems I'm the only person not interested in seeing this movie. <laughs> there is, uh, they made $1.7 billion at the box office within less than two weeks. That is a lot of money. That is a mind-blowing amount of money. Anyhow, I've called my message today the end game because this word, this phrase end game has a whole lot to do with and, and is very relevant when we think about leaving a legacy. What is this term end game? You know, where did it come from? Uh, what does it even mean? And it originally comes from the game of chess. It originally comes, chess is a, a strategic game and it defines the end stages of the game, the end game, where there's just a few pieces left on the board and someone's about to win. You know, it's tense, it's exciting, check and checkmate, and that's all I know about chess. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> true story. It just is not like other games. You know, in other games, winning can be just totally random. Like, you know, you play snakes and ladders or something, and it's all just dependent on the roll of the dice. You roll, you win, you lose. It, chess is not like that. If you're going to win at the game of chess, you have to play with the end game in mind. The moves you make in real time, they're all intended to secure you the end game, to secure you the win later. And a good chess player knows that every move has future consequences. You have to think ahead because you're working towards the end game. Winning at chess is not accidental. You know, if you win a game of chess, you know you have to be intentional. What's all this got to do with legacy? I'm glad you asked. Quite, quite a bit. It's got quite a bit because much like winning a game of chess, to leave a legacy is not accidental. It's intentional. It's actually intentional. Legacy leavers know that they have to play the game of life with the end game in mind. See, legacy, you describe it, you define it as anything that's handed down from one person to another, uh, maybe a gift or an inheritance that's conveyed from one to another. And leaving a significant legacy is not something that you will do accidentally. You don't like accidentally sacrifice. It's not like, you know, oops, there I go, sacrificing again, silly me. There's, that, <laughs> That's not how it works. You don't accidentally give. 
You don't accidentally invest. You don't accidentally encourage or bless or pray or teach or train. You don't invest. You do all of those things intentionally. You never get to the end of your life having accidentally had a stream of people behind you celebrating the legacy that you left. You know, if that is the case, if someone celebrates the legacy you left with your life, then it tells me that you've been intentional with your life. So many different people, different types of people that you will interact with and encounter in your life, but not everyone will leave a legacy in your life. We, we rub shoulders with all sorts. We have all sorts that play different roles in our life and maybe even a place of influence. But there's only a select few people that you will really remember and recall as having had a deep and lasting impact on you. There are some types of people that live with absolutely no regard for the future. They have no end game. Life for them is all about now. They, they want to find the joy now. They want to experience now. It's happiness now. It's now, now, now. And I just want to say that those people are typically not legacy leavers. There's another type of people that uh, they do have the future in mind, like they do have an end game but their end game is more for personal gain. You know, like personal successes and my, my personal ambition and what I can accumulate for me and mine and that sort of thing. Those people also are not typically legacy leavers. But then there's a third type of people who also regard the future and they do have an end game, but it's not for personal gain. Their end game is others. So they channel what they have. They take the wealth. They take the resource. They take what they have of themselves, even if it's small, and they channel it so that someone else could be blessed. They give away from themselves so that someone else could be encouraged or promoted or, or released. And it's these types of people that are our legacy leavers. In this house, we have a disproportionate amount of people like that. In this church, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been through all four services today and I'm thinking of our other locations as well. We have a disproportionate amount of legacy leavers, of just big-hearted people who have lived life to serve others, be they biological parents or spiritual parents or, like I said, just ordinary people, whether it was pouring into their own family or pouring into the church family, even pouring into the community. But we've got these people that have lived their life for others. And you've got to stop and think, if you have been a beneficiary, you know, if someone has been that sort of person to you, uh, we need to realize that we have been someone's end game. We have been their end game. Like our legacy leavers have actually come and been intentional with us in various ways. They've given to us and prayed for us and, and believed in us and done all manner of things. And I'm not talking about being perfect. You know, no, no one's being perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect legacy lever. But in some way or shape or form, they've been intentional with their lives so that we would be blessed and encouraged and established. And, and we, for every person in this place that is a legacy lever, we want to honour you. That is the heart of this day. We want to say that we deeply acknowledge and see you and from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. And I just wonder if we could, you join me in just a round of applause for every legacy lever. We honour what you've given. We honour your sacrifice. We honour every time you've given beyond yourself and what it's cost you. We honour you. We honour you. And I hope you feel that. I hope you feel the sincerity which, with which we, we take the time and we give it the air time. And I want to take the rest of our time here together tonight to think for, for every single person in this room 
you know, to think about what it actually takes to leave a legacy with your life. You know, I know we've got a lot of young people in the room, but I love what Claire said, and I feel that there's a great anointing on what Claire said previously, that legacy starts now. So, so young people, can I say, don't tune out to this message because I actually feel like God wants to specifically minister to young people after um, I finish preaching tonight. Don't you tune out. This is not a message for old people. This is a message for you. This is a message for you. But let's have a think together about what it takes to leave a spiritual legacy. Not, not so much a material legacy, although if you can do that, you should do that. But, but to leave a legacy of faith, what does it take to have the end result of our life mean that many, many people were impacted for Jesus? Like what, what would that take? And for the purposes of our, our conversation tonight, we're going to use the Apostle Paul out of the New Testament as our legacy mentor. He's our man tonight. <laughs> you know, if you're looking for a mentor and what it takes to leave a legacy tonight, it's Paul. You know, and he's so inspirational when it comes to legacy because let's face it, here I am. 2,000 years have elapsed and we're still talking about what he talked about. Leaning into the brilliance of his teaching, the, the revelation that he contended for, the Gentile church that he founded. I mean, you want to talk legacy, Paul left an incredible legacy. And we're going to unpack some of the attributes of his life to, to look at the elements that enabled the legacy that he left. And the first thing I notice about Paul when it comes to legacy was that he defined his end game. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, define your end game? Define your end game. Define your end game. You have to define your end game. You have to know in life what it is that you're working towards. What is it that you're working towards? Paul knew his end game. He totally knew what he was about. He's like, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm an apostle of God. I'm here for you. He said in Col Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, he says this. He says, we proclaim him, that is Jesus. We proclaim Jesus, warning and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present every person complete in Messiah, complete in Jesus. To this end, I labor. To this end, I strive with with all his strength, which is powerfully at work in me. He's like, I, I know what I'm working towards. I want to make Jesus famous. I'm warning people. I'm teaching people so that every person may be found complete in him. This is my end game. He knew his end game. You know, as a church, we've desired to be a legacy-leaving church. And because of that, we too have had to define our end game. You know, we penned the eight culture statements. Our eighth culture statement says we are about the generations. We have the future in mind. We're building something now that future generations will inherit. That is an end game statement. It's an end game statement that our mandate is similar, you know, that the lost would be found, that disciples would be made, that nations would be reached. It's also an end game statement. We've, we've defined the end game and it's so great when you defined, define the end game because it brings clarity. It brings clarity because what you want to see tomorrow, it just drives what it is that you do today. That's why as a church, we build our future every year. That's why as a church, we invest into kids. We invest into youth and young adults because we know what our end game is. And I want to challenge every one of you in the room. If, if you are the sort of person that wants to leave a legacy of faith, a legacy of faith for a new generation, that at some stage or another, you too will have to define your end game. At some stage, you need to be able to articulate, what is it that I'm about? Yeah. You know, what would my win look like? What would, what would winning at life look like to me? Because the answer to the question of tomorrow directs the things you do today. Yeah. A few years ago, the Lord took me on a, on a journey with himself uh, of really defining my own personal endgame. I'd been 
I think in a bit of a season of life where maybe I was a bit distracted, you know, maybe I was a bit um, confused or, or disillusioned or just scatterbrained. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, it hadn't been easy. And just in my quiet times with God, I found myself really hammering out the answer to this question, like, what am I all about? Where's my place? Where's my fit? Like, what, what am I working towards? And, and God was gracious in that season. And I came out of that time just having this complete and utter resolve in my heart that my life was about three things. My God, my family, my church. That's it. My God, my family, my church. It's not like other things are bad. Other things are fine. Other, other things are good and great. They're just not my end game. You know, and, and I hope that, that telling you that doesn't sound in any way weird or, or boastful, but I just told you that to say that it's been so helpful to define my end game because as I know what the goal is, as I know what it is that I'm saying yes to, it just helps me know what I have to say no to. It's like the answer of the question of tomorrow is directing and keeping me on track for today. You have to define your end game. And as much as you have to define your end game, you also have to align your end game. You know, if it's a legacy of faith that you want to leave, then you have to align your end game to the heart of Christ. It's possible to have a completely unaligned end game. <laughs> You've got to align it to what Jesus says. And during Jesus' time on earth, he actually spoke so many amazing things about end game living, about living towards the end of things. And he warned us, he warns us that there's a type of winning at life that in the end will turn out to be no type of winning whatsoever. And to me, there is no sadder state of affairs than to feel like you're winning only to end up at the end of your days realising you didn't win at all. Like, is that not the saddest state of affairs? And Jesus warns us in Matthew 16 and so many other places, but 1626, we're going to take a look at. It says this, it says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. Jesus was speaking rhetorically. Uh, it wasn't a question that he was expecting an answer for, but if we were going to answer it, it's like, well, that's not very good. You know, that is not a good situation. It would not be good to gain the whole world but forfeit my soul. It would not be good to gain everything in a temporal sense at the expense of things from eternal sense, from an eternal sense. That sort of gain would prove to be no gain at all. And Jesus continues on and he says, if you love your life, you're going to lose it. He's talking about a temporal life. He's talking about things that pertain to this earthly existence. If you love power, if you love possession, if you love prominence and popularity and pleasure, if you love, if those things are your end game, then you're going to lose the higher life in Christ. You're going to lose it. But if you let go of the temporal stuff, if you, if you let go, if you deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow Jesus in the losing your life, you'll find it. You find the life that is truly life. It's this incredible paradox of the kingdom that you've got to lose it to find it. Paul our legacy mentor, he actually, uh, prior to encountering Jesus, uh, he, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. We know that. And we know prior to that, he was a Pharisee. He was a devout Jew. And he undergoes this process of radical change as Jesus comes into his life and changes his life. And the book of Philippians chapter 3 tells, talks to us about this list of impressive qualifications that he had prior to meeting Jesus. He, he, he had power. He had position. He had he had prominence and education. He had so many things going for him in an earthly sense. But in verse 7 of the chapter, he says this incredible thing. He says, 
whatever, as in previously, whatever previously were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of a surpassing worth, a greater worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, and I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in Him. The thing that happened, what happened, the gains to me have now become a loss. The gains to me previously were a loss. What happened? Well, when he met Jesus, his end game changed. When he met Jesus, he entered into this whole new life in Christ and he realized that all of his gaining was actually no type of gaining at all. It's so important that we align our end game to the heart of Christ because I don't know about you, but I don't want to get to the end of my days finding out I've won the wrong game. I don't want to win the wrong game. I don't want to find out that I gained all of these things for the, at the expense of what Christ was truly calling me to. So how is it that we do then align ourselves to the heart of Christ? And again, Paul gives us an incredible insight into what it looks like to live an aligned life, to to be on the same page as Jesus. And it says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. And this life I live in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's like he loved me and gave himself for me. He gave everything for me. And now it's my turn to give everything to him. He says it's no longer I that lives. In other words, it's not about my purpose anymore. It's not about my will anymore and my desires and all these things. It's Christ lives in me. It's his purposes and his will and his desire. It's like you're saying Christ's end game has now become my end game. Christ's agenda has become my agenda. And I want to say that this is the process. This is the process that any believer who wants to leave a legacy of faith, there has to be a laying down of our end game so we can pick up his. A laying down of our agendas so we can pick up the agenda of heaven. And the thing is that it's pretty simple. Like we know from Scripture that the agenda of Christ for you and for I, most simply stated, is that we would love God and love people. And I love that. It's not some unobtainable thing. There is nobody in this room that cannot simply, with every fiber of their being, love God and love people, serve God and serve people. And if we do that, if we make that the end game of our life, I want to say, you won't be able to help but leave a significant legacy of faith for a new generation, you know? Once we've, we've, we've got this concept of end game and we've defined it and, and we've aligned it, but once we've done that, there comes a point where we must live it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, live it out. We've got to live our end game out. We've got to live it because a legacy cannot be left overnight. A legacy is only left over a lifetime. There's this sense to which you have to step out your legacy day by day, your lifetime day by day. Life is long, yeah? Life is long. And, and you know, there's that saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's right. I feel like life is like an elephant. How do you live a lifetime? You just, you know, it's one bite at a time, one step at a time. And as we live out this end game, you've got to ask the question, well, what does it look like? Practically speaking, like what does that look like day by day by day? And if we again head back to our legacy mentor tonight, back to Paul, we know that um, his life was perfectly aligned. We know that he embodied love for for God and people. So what exactly was it that he did? What did he do? 
And we can answer this question by looking closely at his relationship with his spiritual son, Timothy. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy and Timothy was leading the early church in in Ephesus. And there was this sense to which Paul poured his life out into the the son Timothy and he wrote the book of first the books of first and second Timothy they were letters they were letters from Paul to Timothy to help him in the leading of the church and if you want to talk about what it is to just invest so much and embody this love for God and people then we can see it very clearly in this relationship and the thing is that Timothy the son would have never been able to do the things he did. He would never have been able to lead the way he led if it wasn't for Paul's influence in his life. What's most encouraging, the things we're about to look at from the life of Paul, what's most encouraging about these things is that they're so accessible. They're so simple and anyone here can leave a legacy and access these things. So what was it that he did? The first thing we need to see is that he simply saw Timothy. He just saw him. He saw him. See, Timothy was a, like the young upstart, you know, the young up-and-coming new generation minister. He, he had a lot of potential but no experience. And we know from the book of First and Second Timothy that he struggled with fear. He had, a, he had an issue with timidity. He had an insecurity because he was young. Because he was of his age, he didn't think he would be respected. But Paul saw him. He could have easily written this guy off. You know, he, sheesh, this guy, too young, too experienced. Ain't nobody got time for that. But that was not the attitude of he, Paul as a father. He saw the gift of God on him. He saw the potential in him. Not only did he see it, he released it. And and Paul says in his second letter to Timothy, he's like, Timothy, my dear son, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you by the laying on of my hands. In other words, I love this. You can hear the voice of the Father. He's like, Don't you let that fire go out, boy. You stir that thing up. I see you. I see what's on you. I see what God wants to do in your life. Don't you be discouraged. Stir it up. There's people in this room today and and across the day that have seen us. It's so powerful when someone sees more in you than you can see in yourself. They believe in you and pray for you and call it out of you. And it's so powerful because when someone else believes in you, it gives you the courage, does it not, to believe in yourself? It's powerful to just see someone. I remember when I think about these things, I remember my first young adults pastor, Pastor Brad Bonholm, who now lives and ministers um, in New South Wales. But... I was such a rough diamond, man. I'd just come, I see my Blundstone boots and my corduroy pants, which are all coming back in. Hello. I was the OG. <laughs> just come back into the house of God after a season of being backslidden and and rough as anything but he saw me he saw me and he saw a gift of God on me even though I was very unpolished and in that he gave me my first opportunities preached my very first message which was so bad but you know I led my first connect group all because he saw me and he was prepared to release me I just want to say God bless the people that saw us God bless the people that believed in us and never wrote us off even when we were being stupid and silly Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Do I have a loud amen? (laughs) You know, Paul didn't just see Timothy. He actually spoke to Timothy. He, He continually spoke these two letters. If you read them back to back, they are full of every kind of speaking, you know, instruction, encouragement, wisdom, counsel, correction. He spoke on faith. He spoke on life. He spoke on leadership. He's just speaking everywhere, speaking. And if we need, if we're going to leave a legacy of faith, we also need to speak. We need to not be silent. We must speak because we cannot leave a new generation to their own devices. 
We can't leave people to make up their own mind about these things. When fathers and mothers are silent and don't speak, all a new generation is left to do is interpret that silence. They're going to find other voices to fill the void. They're going to make up their own rules and fill in the blanks. And that is not a good thing. You need guidance, young people. You know, it, it's not a good thing. We need to speak because if the end game is to impact people for Jesus, they need to hear our voice. They need to hear the godly counsel that's on our life. The enemy is a mongrel. And he tries to shut us up. Whoever you are in this room, I bet you've heard the voice of the accuser. What would you know? And you don't have anything to say. And maybe you're irrelevant or you're too far gone. Or they're not even going to listen to you and you're going to look stupid. But he is a liar. He is a liar. And don't shut up. Shut him up and speak. Share your testimony. Maybe you don't know the Bible back to front. Just share your testimony. Share what God's done. Share His goodness and His faithfulness. Open your mouth to bless somebody. It doesn't cost you much. Open your mouth to encourage someone to say what you see on their life. Open your mouth to just... It was in Paul's speaking that Timothy actually stayed on track. Our speaking can help someone stay on track. How simple is it to just speak? We need to speak. Not only did he speak, but he showed. He, he modelled with his life. How powerful is it when someone practices what they preach? It's one thing to hear them say it. It's another thing to watch them live it. There's a new generation. It's not just listening to what we say, but it's watching what we do. And Paul said this. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What an incredible thing to be able to say. I'm so convinced that I'm going the right way. I'm so convinced that I'm aligned with the heart of Christ. So you just imitate me and you'll be good. What an incredible thing to be able to say. But, you know, the funny thing is, as I look at legacy leavers within this church, they're living lives that I would want to imitate. There is so many people uh, who have gone before me that are living lives the way they've so generously served people. I'd love to imitate that. The way they've so been so authentic in their faith. It's worthy of imitation. The way they've raised families and, and just showed up in season and out of season. They are practicing what they preach and their lives are leaving an incredible legacy. And finally, as the band comes and joins me, he saw, he spoke, he showed, and finally he stayed. Paul stayed to the very end. He stayed faithful to the very end. I want to say legacy leavers don't quit. Legacy leavers know what it is to show up in just year after year, regardless of what is going on, regardless of what is happening. Paul says they are joyful in hope, joyful as they hope. They are patient in affliction and they are faithful in prayer. Paul actually wrote the book of 2 Timothy. He wrote it from prison. He wrote it just prior to his execution. He knew he was going to be executed. He's shackled because of the gospel. Not because he did anything wrong. He's shackled because of the gospel of Christ. If anyone had reason to stop speaking, to stop showing, to stop giving life, it was probably Paul. I don't know that anyone's being shackled, facing execution for the sake of Christ in this room. I know we're not. We're free in this country, praise God. But if anyone had a reason to stop speaking, to stop leaving a legacy, it was him. And yet he didn't. He stayed the course until his dying day. He stayed the course. And it says in the final chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul speaking, he said, My life is being poured out like a drink offering. He's talking about about to die. The time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I don't know about you. I want to be able to say that at the end of my life. I fought the good fight. 
finish the race. I've kept the faith. What an end game. My charge to people in the room is just don't quit. Just keep on eating that elephant one bite at a time. Don't quit. Maybe you feel discouraged because something didn't go very well or you spoke and you felt like an idiot or whatever. If, and maybe you have quit. That's all right. Just pick it up again. Maybe you have gotten distracted and pursued the goal of your own heart, not the goal of Christ. That's okay. Just turn around and pick it up again. Just pick it up again. You know, it doesn't matter what's happened in the past. If you've never thought of yourself about be, as being a legacy lever, tonight, you can just pick it up for the first time. Pick it up for the first time. And I believe that as we do, the impact in this room could be beyond our wildest imaginations if we would just be faithful, see and speak and show and stay. See a great many people impacted for Jesus. Amen. All over this place, why don't you stand to your feet? Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful touch of God in this room. I feel faith in this room. I feel faith in the hearts of people as they've been listening and as you're worshipping tonight. I really feel like God wants to move tonight. I feel like He's going to move powerfully. But before we do that, before we do that, I just want to speak to you in the room right now. Don't move if you don't have to move. If you have to, go for it. But if you don't, just stay for a moment. I want to speak to you in this room if you don't know Jesus. You don't know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about him like a friend, like my best friend, because that's exactly what he is. And he invites everybody who wants to, everybody who wants to, that's the only key, the ones who want to, into relationship with himself, not into religion. Who wants that? Not me. But he invites us into relationship with himself. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. God so loved the world that He sent Jesus. Jesus came to earth. The Son of God came to earth. He scuffed around in the dirt and experienced all the rubbish just like we do. But He lived life perfectly. The perfect Son of God went to the cross, died for our sin, died for all of our rubbish and rose again. And He made a way. That was the way. He made a way, a bridge between sinful man and a holy God. He made a way for us to be able to come into the very presence of God, starting now and all the way through into eternity. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves you. He wants you in relationship with Him. The only issue is whether or not you open your heart and receive Him. That's the only issue. That's the only issue. There's no one that's too far gone. There's no one that the roof would cave in if they walked into the church. So that thing, that's rubbish. There's no one beyond the reach of God. There's no one beyond the love of God. And if you're here tonight, you're saying, I believe in Jesus. And I want to ask Him to come into my life. And if He made my life, if He can help my life mean something, if He can help me leave a legacy with my life, then I want in. I want this relationship that you're speaking of. And, and it, right now, if everyone could just close their eyes right all over this building, just close your eyes as a sign of respect for everybody. In just a moment, if you're saying, that's me, if your heart's beating fast, if, if, if you feel a bit weird, that's God, that's His presence. He's, he's on you for this moment because He's calling you. It's like He's knocking on the door of your heart, going, open up to me because I love you and I'm going to show you the best version of you. I'm going to show you a purpose for you. And if that's you here tonight and you want to invite Jesus into your life right now with nobody looking around, can you just raise your hand? Raise your hand. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I see that hand. That's incredible. Yeah, so good. So good. I'm not going to single anyone out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make a spectacle. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer of faith. Yeah, see that hand. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's so cool. Anybody else join these two young people? Say, yeah, I want to open my life to Jesus tonight. Come on, we got time for you. You're important. 
You matter in this house. You matter in this house so much. We love you because we know how much God loves you. Anybody else going to join these two people? Okay, I can't see any more hands. This is what I'm going to do for, for those two people that raise their hand. This is your moment. By faith, open up your heart to God. Just open it up wide. And I'm going to lead the whole church in a prayer. I'll say a line and repeat it. And tonight, by faith, your life changes and you walk out of here different to the way you walked in. Come on, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. I believe He is the Son of God. I believe He died. I believe He rose again so that I could live free so that I could be forgiven, so that I could be washed, so that I could be made new. So right now, come into my heart, wipe the slate clean, lead me in hope, lead me in purpose, show me the future that you have for my life. I wanna live with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, let's just praise Him for those two awesome decisions. Thank you, God. For those two people that raised your hands, our leaders have seen you. And, and they're just going to come to you after the service, give you a Bible, pray with you, encourage you, help you with what the next step is. Where to from now? We love you. We're proud of you. Well done. But for everybody else, do not switch off because I really felt like God gave me a specific thing that He wants to pray, that we, we're going to open up this altar and the Lord wants to minister to. And I'm actually directing, even though it's Legacy Sunday, which seems weird, I feel like there's an anointing and a grace to speak, to, to um, minister to youth and young adults, young people in the room. Listen up, because I believe the Lord wants to speak to you. And like we've already said, your legacy starts now. He wants you to know your legacy starts now. And the verse that kept on echoing in my head was this out of the book of Joshua. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great things amongst you. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do great things among you. And what I, what that, that moment, if you read the passage in the book of Joshua, there was a moment they were about to go into victory. They were about to go into breakthrough. They were about to go into conquest. But there was a moment before that looked like preparation. There was a moment before that looked like alignment. And, and God, even though this sounds weird, if you don't know the Old Testament, He goes got them to circumcise all the men. But that was an Old Testament practice that now in the New Testament practice, it reflects cutting off things from our heart and cutting off things from our life and cutting off things that, that will not be good and beneficial for you in the future that God wants to take you into. And I feel like we're gonna open this altar as a place of alignment. And we're gonna open this altar as a place of consecration. And what God's gonna do is there's been goals in your head and goals in your heart and purposes of your life that have got nothing to do with the purposes of Christ. And you're gonna come here and it's gonna be a moment of consecration going, God, I put those things on the altar. I put those things on the altar. Lord, consume what I place on the altar. There's a place of surrender and you're going to consecrate yourself because tomorrow God will do great things. And if you know youth, young adults, anybody really just come. If God's speaking to you right now, come because Ken's going to lead us.